Hi, my name is Jonathan Abrahams, and today I'm really excited to share with you our research on genome plasticity in bacteria. I feel this is a field that doesn't get enough attention, so I'm really thankful to Oxford and for, for allowing me to speak about it today. We work primarily on the species uh, Bordetella pertussis, which is the causative agent of the disease whooping cough. But I feel our work is uh, fundamental to many species of bacteria. So just today I'd like to narrow down what I mean by genome plasticity in the context of this talk. I'm specifically talking about um, plasticity mediated by recombination within a single genome. So really I'm trying to exclude the thought of horizontal gene transfer. We're talking about just using material within a single uh, gene. So here we have a orange piece of DNA, which is flanked by two repeat regions. And these repeats are able to recombine and cause structural variants such as deletions, duplications, and inversions. I'm gonna mostly be talking about duplications and that's what I've pictured here, is a tandem array of this orange section. And this is one of the most frequent uh, types of mutation in bacteria, these structural variants. They happen much more frequently than SNPs. And many bacterial species have a high amount of repeat content, mostly through insertion sequences, which are able to replicate themselves. So um, this is a really, really interesting study, the OASIS study, which showed that there was hundreds of bacterial species with high repeat content. And I've just graphed the 30 most repetitive genomes here. As you can see over here, we have the Shigellas, which have some have just highly, highly repetitive regions, up to 650 insertion sequences per genome. And because these are some of the most um, frequent mutations, uh, structural variants are the most frequent mutations, this causes the uh, genomes to be highly, highly uh, unstable because genetic instability is driven by uh, the amount of repetitive content. And here is pertussis here in red. Um, you can see it's by no means unique. It's, it's bang in the middle of some of these strains, um, but it's also known to have evolved by genome reduction. We're saying it's also undergoing uh, other types of genome plasticity. So pertussis has over 250 copies of IS481. Um, as you're going to see, this gives it a really plastic genome. So you can study this property of genomes using the Nanopore platform. It's an excellent way of doing it. And there are two main ways of doing it. And unfortunately, I can't go into our methods in detail today. Please check out our paper or ask me a question on it. Um, you can generate reads which capture your whole tandem array. Um, that means they need to be bigger than your whole array. And that was problematic in pertussis. Conceptually, these reads are the easiest to understand, but in practice, they're actually hard to generate and hard to analyze. So in pertussis, our average duplication length in its time of formation was about 100 kb, and it's very hard to get reads that size unless you treat your DNA very nicely. So that's what we did. We made ultra long read uh, DNA, and so you can see it on the platform, and we were, able, we were able to capture these events like this. But if your tandem rate is much bigger, maybe 500 KB, 700 KB, it's very unlikely, even using special protocols, that you will be able to capture that on the platform. So in those cases, you can generate reads which just span the junction because they will have a unique sequence. The end of the orange part will be next to the beginning of the orange part, and that is not normally a configuration that you'll see uh, in your native uh, form of the mutation. So uh, we're going to show you. I'm going to show you two experiments that we did, which exemplify these two methods. Um, which is they're all part of a larger body of work on this subject, um, which revolved around screening huge amounts of Illumina data. We screened about two thousand Illumina strains, and we found there was a prevalence of eight percent. 8% obviously these strains had these mutations, these duplications. And from that pool, we were able to 
identify isolates that we wanted to study further using um, Nanopore. So we found one UK54, which was predicted to have four copies of a 16 kb region. Uh, this meant in its full tandem configuration, it had four to five copies, which was about uh, 60 to 80 kb. We expected to find a population with four copies of this. That's what our read depth based estimates were telling us. So there's four times as many reads. But actually what we found was considerably different. So here is our population uh, as yellow circles in our flask. And what we really found was that reads had one, four or five copies of the tandem array. So here are our reads on the X, each individual read and our copy numbers on the y-axis. So we found some reads with four copies, uh, some reads with one copy, and some reads with five copies. And that's reflected in our population over here. So this was a heterogeneous population. This was a population that was dynamic and it was fluid. And subsequent experiments could show that this population could change in as little as two passages. Um, and it was just this whole mix and it's not a static population. And this is what genome fluidity is about. It's about rapid changes, and pertussis isn't known to be a rapidly changing uh, bacteria. So this is really exciting. Uh, in a second experiment, we identified UK76 as having a duplication that was 600 to 700 kb long in its full tandem length. And whilst we did generate fantastic quality data for this isolate, um, the duplication was just too large to fit into a single read. So that's where our second methodology comes in of using reads that just span the junction between uh, the two halves of the duplication. So I think conceptually this is much harder to understand. So I've uh, got a special effort to draw a different diagram here. Just using the letters of the English alphabet doesn't mean genes, doesn't mean anything. It's just a way of understanding how this experiment works. So say we have the series A, B, C, D and it's duplicated, and now we have A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. There is a unique sequence here, which identifies some sort of event like this has taken place, which is this, D is next to A. D is never normally next to A in the English alphabet, doesn't really happen. So to represent this event, we can use this notation. So our expected order is here in a circle, A, B, C, D, and D has a line connecting it to A to show that this is an unexpected event. This is a re uh, arrangement of letters we saw, but we didn't expect to see. So using that to explain our UK76 data, uh, it's like this. Here's our UK76 genome. And this is where we saw increased coverage, and therefore this is the exact uh, duplication we expected to see. We expected all cells to have this duplication. That was contrary to what we saw. Again, we saw rapid fluidity, extremely heterogeneous population. We had uh, at least 20 different duplications present uh, at that locus. So they weren't necessarily different copy numbers, but they had completely different gene contents. Potentially, this duplication was being remodeled in that population. And interestingly enough, unexpectedly, what we saw was um, mutations at other sites in the genome. And this signified that there was uh, structural variations happening in all the genome of this string. And that specifically is what we found in many, many different genomes. All the genomes we've seen have had at least a few reads that show this configuration. Now, whilst I don't, can't go into it right now, we are really confident that we're not looking at chimeras. We are looking at real structural variants. You can ask me questions on that. So, I encourage you, yes, to read uh, the main publication of this work, um, as a which is a preprint at the moment, and also check out uh, Natalie Ring's paper about um, resolving pertussis genomes, and she painstakingly benchmarks different tools to do that. And also um, check out Josh Quick's protocol on ultra long read sequencing. It made some fantastic quality data for us, and it was really, really useful. Just like to uh, show you this graph again to show that pertussis is not unique. This is likely a story that is being replicated in many different strains and I feel it's not getting enough attention. So 
If you work on a funny bacteria with a funny repetitive genome, please get in touch. And uh, I'd love to be able to collaborate and expand our work. And we've already started doing that. So get in contact. Uh, I'd love to help you out. Uh, clearly, this was not just done by myself. I had a fantastic group of collaborators who worked on this. Unfortunately, I can't thank them all individually right now. But I'd just like to give a special thanks to Natalie Ring, who generated all of the ultra long read nanopore data you saw today in association with Nick Lohman and Josh Quick from the University of Birmingham. And I'd like to thank my funding bodies, University of Bath and Public Health England, who funded uh, my PhD and funded this work. And thank you for listening.